but we can't put the, co- the, the, the cart before the horse. It's really important when you're looking at your research studies to consider your starting point. And I know I've shown you this slide before and I'll show it to you again because I really want you to think about this in relation to how you're doing your studies. So many people do put the cart before the horse and they say, well, when I want to do some research, I'd love to do surveys or interviews or focus groups or questionnaires. That's putting the cart before the horse. You're starting the wrong way around. It's really important to know your epistemological starting point. What's the lens through which you are looking at your research topic? Um, So you need to work that one out first. So what's your positionality here in relation to the particular topic that you want to study? What's your starting point here? And once you've thought of that starting point, that can quite often dictate to you which genre of methodology you're going to use. So say, for example, if you want to look at the topic of um, domestic violence, then you choose, well, whose perspectives are you looking at here? Are you going to be looking at it from a victim's point of view or from the perpetrators? Or are there any onlookers uh, in, in regards to all of this? And who are those onlookers? Are they other adults that may be turning a blind eye? Um, are they children viewing this? And what's going to be the impact on children, especially on understanding of gender relations, Uh, when they see domestic violence happening. So which point of view are you going to be looking at? How are you going to view this? And that may then point to you which particular methodology you'll use um, in relation to getting the most out of your particular studies. Once you've decided on the particular methodology you're going to use, and usually you can say, well, I'm either doing a quantitative study or a qualitative, or I'm combining bits of, bo- bits of both, so it's going to be a mixed methods study, okay? And then out of that, then you know, well, with those particular genres, what type of tools do they like doing? Uh, what methods do they use to try to do the inquiry as best as possible? So that's the way in which you approach it, not by starting off saying, oh, I want to do multiple choice questions and work backwards from there. And I've uh, plugged this website to you on numerous occasions, um, etimonline.com. So whenever you do come across some of these words, you're not too sure of the meanings, either go to Google or Google Scholar or certainly check out the etymology. And the etymology means study of the origins of the words and how they've changed over time. So it could be that words that we're using now today um, have been around for a long time, but maybe they're not used in the same way as they were when they were originally invented. So it's really worth looking at that. Or sometimes it may be that they come from different languages. And it's great to see the, the linguistic nuance that's used in various understandings and meanings for words. So when it comes to interpretivist and qualitative research epistemologies, there are a few listed on the screen here, which will show you some of the key um, epistemologies that people often use as a starting point to understand the particular uh, phenomena that they are exploring. And remember when you're using words like phenomenon or phenomena or data or um, datum, always make sure that you're getting the endings right. So phenomenon is singular, Phenomena, a plural. Datum um, is singular. Data are plural. Okay. Uh, But here you'll see uh, there are various forms of uh, uh, um, epistemologies which may help you then in understanding whatever it is that you're looking at. And another term that you may come across quite often in research studies is to do with triangulation. And that comes from natural sciences in particular, where they wish to triangulate something. And by that, they mean just think of a triangle. So it's three sides. So they may say, well, they're triangulating between doing multiple choice questions, um, other research papers they're reading for their literature review, and one other particular uh, method of inquiry. So triangulation is three equal sides. So although lots of people doing qualitative research say that they're going to triangulate this, so they may be doing um, questionnaire, 
um, in-depth interviews or focus groups, and then they're checking this out with the literature of what other studies have been published. So they're saying that we're looking at it from three different perspectives. So triangulation is used a lot, but you might want to think of some other terms as well. And again, if you go to Google Scholar, put these terms in and try to find references for them and then start reading about that so you know the difference. Because especially for examinations where people go for a viva voce, an in-life examination with doctoral studies, for example, that's when you're going to be questioned on all of this. So if a person says, oh, I'm using the process of crystallization, you will be asked, well, why did you choose that and why didn't you just triangulate? So you have to understand the words that you're saying, and that's really important. So read all around your topic area, not just the particular issues, become really quite broad in your understanding of all of these things. So the difference here between triangulation, kaleidoscopy, or crystallization, so I've mentioned triangulation, so think of that as a threefold way of looking at something. But the kaleidoscope, think of those little um, tubes that many of us would have had as children, and you're looking through the tube, but and you see all these different colors moving. But it's different, the patterns that come out are gonna be different, whether you're looking out at the sunlight or looking into darkened areas or into what colored lights in the room or whatever. So the pattern's different, all according to um, um, the, the background light for this. So kaleidoscopy is looking at things in different ways and especially noticing how it all changes and especially changing within different situations. Crystallization, and again, if you check that word out, there are numerous meanings. So uh, somebody may use the word crystallization in relation to uh, scientific studies, how uh, water crystallizes to become ice, or it may be a case of beautiful sugary fruits, you know, the crystallized fruits. You're not talking of any of that. What you're talking of here is the way that numerous elements of data come in are refracted uh, meet in the middle somewhere and go out to be totally different to what came in. So I suppose, and I've got a little crystal here, if you think of it from the point of view of a crystal like that, imagine if light was coming in, if the sunlight was coming in. Now it's coming in at certain angles, so the light is coming in in different ways, it's being refracted into the middle, but what comes out is totally different. And especially as this side of it changes, what comes out here is dynamic. And if you look up the word on Etym Online, for example, if you look up the word dynamism, again, that's another ancient Greek word. Uh, it's where we get our word dynamic from, but again, it's another form of power. So if something is dynamic, it's moving, it's changing, it's evolving. So it's always worth checking out these differences so that you know which is going to be the best for you to use and you will get far more fulfillment from your studies the greater you understand all the stuff that you're talking about. And especially by doing, a, you're doing a master's degree at the moment, so giving you mastery over your topic in really broad ways. Now, one of the terms I mentioned a moment ago on the list of different epistemologies was to do with post-structuralism. And one particularly famous post-structuralist, and there are many, but just one in particular, is Michel Foucault. And Foucault would argue, well, he can't now, he's dead, but Foucault argued then that there are no objective or universal truths. Now, that's very different to natural science and the way that natural science approaches things. So he's saying there's no objective or universal truths, but particular forms of knowledge and the ways of being, ontology, um, that they engender become naturalized in culturally and historically specific ways. So even if you're thinking of cultures where they think, well, men behave in one way, women behave in another, look how that's now become naturalized. And there's a fantastic book in queer theory called The Trouble with Normal uh, by Michael Warner. And that book asks you to critique words like naturalized. So if you say, or it's natural for somebody to get angry in a particular situation, or it's natural for somebody to lash out. Maybe not in other cultures. 
So it's worth looking at the differences. There's no universal truth here. It's relative to individuals and to their understandings of it. So again, we're back here to epistemologies and the ways of being, which would be the ontologies. So how are we going to be looking at all of this? Qualitative research then needs to be flexible, it's evolving and it's emergent. It's not as if there's just one way to do things and you're going to expect the same thing to be revealed each and every time. By being emergent, it may mean if you do a study now and then maybe if you, you were to repeat it sometime in the future, the results you find then may be different because it's with different people in different environments, different situations. So it is flexible, evolving, and meanings are emergent. I'll come back to this slide twice in this presentation because it's worth um, uh, focusing on this. Look how uh, some of the studies then are going to be contextual. You want it to be descriptive and exploratory. So you're describing, you're giving a richness of the whole situation so that the, the reader can get a really good understanding of all that you're talking about here. So you describe the situations, you explore how people um, experience their, their, their particular worlds. But also you may be looking at different influences, motivations, or, um, origins, or formations of the subject matter. So if you're talking about people who are victims in life, how did they become a victim? What does the term victim mean? So back to the contextual here, what does the term victim mean? How about people who say, well, I was a victim in the past, I was bullied as a child, or I've been the victim of, of intimate partner violence or domestic violence and abuse. Um, I was a victim, but I've lived through it. I've lived to tell the tale. So they might then describe themselves as a survivor. So what's the difference between victim and victimhood and survivor? And some people might then say, but I now want to empower others. So I actually go and speak at conferences. I tell them um, about the particular phenomena, whether it's violence or whatever it was. I tell them about it, show them as a role model the way I've worked through this. And therefore, I feel as if I'm thriving because of all of this. Now, that's a particular um, notion used by Emily Coulter Thompson in a theoretical and epistemological book called Queering Sexual Violence. And she talks about moving from victim to survivor to thriver, okay? So the positionality, there's another good word, the positionality of all of these, what does it mean, not just to be in that position, but all of the influences around it, so that that's when you're exploring all of this. And that's where the word positionality comes in. It's not just a person's posi physical position, but everything surrounding it, okay? Um, then you may be exploring how things um, work or assessing the impact, especially the impact on individuals. So in relation to COVID-19, for example, you may say, well, I'm really interested on the mental health and well-being of people who are struggling during lockdown. OK, so you want to see how um, what, what impact this is having on them and their mental health and well-being. And then there may be interventions you're looking at, saying, right, we'll, we'll give them a telephone call once every day, or we're going to do a Zoom meeting with them, so that they get in contact, but in different ways. So how is that working? What's the impact on their mental health and well-being? But also qualitative research is really good for generating new ideas um, and especially around social theory, it's new ways of uh, understanding, exploring and um, explaining the worlds in which we live.